Rise to Thrive podcast, episode one, rolling. Welcome to the Rise to Thrive podcast with your hosts, Linda Tate and Amelia Travis, your life resource for manifestation, wellness, and abundance. Tune in weekly to Thrive Daily. This week's episode coming at you. <laughs> Showtime! <laughs> Good afternoon and morning and evening whenever you're listening to our inaugural episode of Rise to Thrive with myself, Linda Elizabeth Tate, and Amelia Travis of Stoked Yogi. We are so excited to have you listening in today and have an exciting topic that could relate to most people starting before you're ready. No accident having this be our first podcast episode, and we are so excited to share our thoughts. Amelia? Good morning and afternoon and evening, world, universe of podcast listeners. Um, Yeah, we're super pumped to be here and to talk to you guys today about starting before you're ready, um, something that I believe is magic and um, have used to great success in many different aspects of my life. So um, this podcast is a perfect example. We are starting before we're ready. We don't even know how to publish this, but we're going to figure it out. And by the time you're listening to this, we obviously did figure it out. So boom, there's a miracle right there. Boom shakalaka. Boom shakalaka. So, so Linda, so we're going to talk today about starting before we're ready. Um, but like, what does that even mean? What does it mean to be ready for something? I think ready means a feeling of go. Like when I think of the word ready, I think of go. And I think starting before you're ready and being ready can sometimes be the same feeling, but just a difference of perspective. So I would propose, can ready be a mindset? Totally. I like that. I think when I was thinking about being ready and what does that mean? For me, it was like having enough information, feeling educated enough, feeling prepared for contingencies. Um, But those all are kind of uh, symptoms or circumstances, which I felt like would enable me to feel ready. And for me, that feeling of readiness was ultimately about like mitigating risk or not having a lot of risk in something. Um, But I kind of think that magic happens when there is risk and you feel the fear and you just do it anyway. Like almost an 80-20 of of ready, 80% ready, 20% magic. Yeah, I'm going to go with mine's probably like (laughs) (laughs) 50-50. In life in general, I'm definitely more of like 50% ready, 50% pocket, we'll figure it out on the way there. Or maybe 51-49 tilted towards ready. Yeah, sure. We'll say that. (laughs) I had a theory in college when you were over 50% since that was over halfway, like you were ready. And that also in my mind should have been passing. (laughs) How did that go for you? I never really aired in that margin much. So it went well, but could have been disastrous. Absolutely. And I think that's kind of, um, that's probably a good and apt description of what happens when you start before you're ready. It usually goes well, but could have been disastrous, um, but often isn't. So, so what are sometimes that like besides this podcast, obviously, which we just shamelessly admitted to um, starting before we're ready that you have started something before you're ready. And what did that look like for you? Well, before we go there, I just want to mention that dictionary.com would like to share with us a definition. I'd love to hear it. They would say ready is a suitable state for an activity action or action where you're fully prepared. So a suitable state where you're pre- fully ready prepared for, for an activity or action. Fully prepared for an activity or action. Mm-hmm. Are you fully prepared for this podcast? Well, that's where I think maybe our definition of ready is a little different from the dictionary. Yeah. I feel like I'm 100% gut check yes on this. I'm the go. I'm the go that you described. So in that sense, perhaps I am ready. Yeah. So to answer your question about other areas of my life where I have or haven't been ready, I think a lot of them where I would feel like 
a question like the hundred percent ready to me is without the question of of hesitation or like should i shouldn't i like the doubt and as you're even asking it i'm like oh do i always feel a hundred percent like there there's always a little bit of a doubt um but i would say still being ready nonetheless so there's like intricacies to these words but i think back to even college college being an example of like are you ready if i zoom out like at 18 am i ready to declare what i want to study for four years and and do that and feel like i've dedicated time money energy to, to that experience and yeah you graduate i graduated at the end of four years with like my dual degrees and I look back at that whole experience and think that's odd. Like I definitely wasn't ready and it worked out great. Does that make sense? Totally. And the I'm listening and thinking, yeah. And the flip side of that can be true. Also, I, um, in terms of my college experience, graduated high school early at, at 17 started community college, um, because I wasn't ready to commit to going to San Diego State or going to a four-year school and then allowed that feeling of lack of readiness to continue on for 16 years. And I am now at the ripe old age of 33 completing a bachelor's degree um, in literature at a four-year university because for too long I allowed myself to believe that I wasn't ready and instead of just starting and committing that wasn't really a problem of not starting. That was a problem of not finishing. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that sense of like, well, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to decide. I'm not ready to make a commitment to something that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm not ready to, uh, to, to finish in that space. Yeah. If I'm not ready to finish. And actually I think that's true. I think for me, it was like, oh, I'm not ready to finish because if I finish, then that means I have to actually be a grown up and actually like, I got to figure it out. Like, what am I doing with my life? You know, mm -hmm. what, what am I going to do next? Um, now that I'm here at the, at the end of it, I am starting to finish before I'm ready and just trusting that I'm going to dive into this next chapter of my life and, um, and do all of those things before I'm ready. But I have found such great success in it. Like for me, when I launched my business, Stoked Yogi, um, it had been an idea that was rolling around in my brain since 2011. It was a blog, but I wasn't ever, I didn't feel ready to pull the trigger on um, becoming my own business and offering the teacher trainings and retreats and workshops and things that I envisioned. And the way it ended up happening was I, um, I wasn't being treated very well um, or being valued the way I thought I should be at my previous job. And I finally quit at the behest of loved ones and people that I trusted. And I went into a little period of incubation and hibernation where I just didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do. We were living on a sailboat at the time and I hid out in the boat and I, I wrote a lot. And, um, and then I had a spiritual experience that basically kind of woke me up and was like, Hey, just put one foot in front of the other and just go these dreams that you have, just do it. And it, it took that for me. It took, you know, hearing, um, the encouragement of something bigger than myself saying, Hey, do this thing. But the magic was then I started before I was ready. I went full force. I borrowed some money. I bought some paddle boards. I bought a van. I did all this stuff. And within three months of making that conscious decision to start, my business was bringing in real income. Um, I had workshops that were selling out and retreats that were filling up and it was all working. And I was like looking around me going, is this even real? And, and I still felt kind of unready, but I was just taking the next right action and putting one foot in front of the other and going, uh, trusting that in that risk and in that space of unpreparedness and unsurety that things were going to come together. And they did. Yeah. I hear a lot of trust. A lot of trust. Yeah. And for me, it was a huge lesson that then um, I got to apply more easily and easily as going forward, um, as I later offered a 200 hour training that I didn't feel ready for, even things that aren't work related, like, um, like I went skydiving and I didn't feel ready to jump out of the plane. 
thankfully. They, they I, what I'm wondering too is like what I said, ready as a state of mind. Like I, I think for me, I always feel ready because I don't believe in like that you're ever a hundred percent ready. So like that doubt sort of is always there and it's just like the decision that you're ready versus not ready because the not ready feeling feels like excuse or procrastination and or perfection. And um, there was a job, I got like a pretty big promotion when I was 26 and I never, I was like, you should hire me because if you don't, you'll never get this opportunity again. And that was like my sales pitch and they did. And uh, at that moment, like being, I think a vice president and in this role at 26. And as I'm into it, I'm like, I wasn't ready for this. But, <laughs> but never like leading up to it, did I think I'm not ready. So I, I'd say there's an element of confidence to readiness. Well, I love that. I feel like one of the things that you just touched on was almost, um, I don't know if I would use the word naivete, but it's kind of does go back to trust and confidence. Um, the, the surety that you had, the confidence that you projected in telling them you're never going to get this opportunity again, you were operating in a space of not really knowing what the thing was that you were diving into, but knowing that you were showing up ready to give 100% of yourself to whatever that thing was. You said something that I think is really interesting, which is um, it's not that you're going to be going into this without any doubt. So I would love to hear, like, how do you feel like you can make friends with doubt or make friends with fear or make friends with that little voice that is telling you, like, hey, you're not ready. You can't do this thing. You're going to fail. Um, how do you allow that to be there and be present with you and still do the damn thing anyway? Yeah, that's an ongoing practice. And I think the way I like dealt with the doubt and the voice five or 10 years ago versus now are different almost because I maybe ignored it a lot more, which is mm -hmm. interesting. And now I hear it and feel it and see it. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like I have more space where before I don't even know if I, I didn't feel it there and it was there. So I couldn't acknowledge it and it would do like damage without me even knowing versus now I feel like fully aware of like, oh, that's fear, that's doubt. Uh, I feel space between like the thought, the emotion of it. And then I'm like, that doesn't need to be any more true than I'm ready a hundred million percent. Like, let's fucking go. So that's, that's how it's just like kind of conscious observation. And uh, I, I laugh, I laugh at it. It's not a hundred percent foolproof. There's times where I definitely can get swept up in like the doubt and the, fear but when as soon as i realize that that's just what's happening i'm like oh like that's a choice at that point to continue in that or do a course correction to a more favorable emotional experience like confidence do you think that there's times where we're really not ready or where that voice of fear or that voice of doubt is actually intuition that's telling us like, Hey, if you do this thing at this particular time, uh, you know, it won't go well. Do you think there's, do you think that there's risk in being overly confident or in just being like, yeah, I'll just do it. Like with me and, and like exams, like midterms or final exams or like any kind of test, I have kind of a, what I would say is a, a dangerous habit of maybe not paying attention and not studying and just being like, I'm confident, like I'm going to rock this test. And unfortunately, I don't know, fortunately, unfortunately, it's always worked out really well for me, which has not forced me to create a new habit. But what I do is not something I would necessarily like advise others to do in terms of being responsible. So what's the difference? What's the difference between feeling doubt and fear that is a warning from your inner self versus the doubt and fear that's just kind of born of anxiety and is, is something we should allow to ride in the car, but not drive. Yeah. That I would say for me, I feel like the stomach, like if I can take a deep breath 
And if I'm, if I'm getting that like intuitive feeling, it shows up more stomach for me and fear, doubt can show up more chest, like anxious, like pressing. And, and even asking myself that question of like, is this, is this like a deeper intuition or is this, um, is this fear creeping in? And I think even in that question, I can tell the difference. And if it's fear, like the answers feel surface, they feel fearful. They fear, feel like sort of all like the stack of reasons why I shouldn't to protect me on like an egoic level where when it's intuition, like it's just more of a feeling and I won't really understand it. And it just can be the no, and I don't need to understand, understand it. So it's, what I'm saying to you right now is that doubt and fear feel like all the excuses, all the potential like protective ego protection, uh, where the intuition just feels like no, without much understanding of why and just like the feeling. I love that so much. I have a similar somatic check-in, I think a body Mm -hmm. check-in. And for me, it usually comes down to two key words where the direction that I am supposed to go feels like freedom Mm -hmm. in my body. And the direction that's not meant for me feels like restriction. It feels like contraction and closing down. There's also for me, like, it depends on the people that are involved. Like there are some people that feel literally like divine flow that almost and I would even say anything, but it feels like a yes. Like I just feel so trusting within the space of that relationship. And um, I feel that fun, that excitement. And it's such an obvious yes. So that I relate to when you said freedom, it, it's like, and the other body feeling is the chills. Like if I'm getting the chills, I'm going to say yes. And it never really guides me astray. Totally, man. I'm right there with you. And especially those full body chills. And then if you're experiencing that with another person and you say to them like, Hey, I'm getting the chills right now. And they're like, me too. Then you're like, Woo, spirit is all around. This is divinely the ultimate confirmation. Yeah, totally. So, so I like that you said, you know, ask yourself what feels like, yes, what feels like freedom, what feels like expansion, what feels like, you know, those chills all over your body. Um, And I think that's, sorry, but a good check-in, even if there's something that is coming up where you're feeling like confused of what is freedom, what does the yes feel like versus, you know, the no or, or restriction, just really checking in around that and I think that framework, like my brother the other day, he's like, you know, you just need the pro con list. And I was rolling my eyes like, oh, this is so annoying. I don't want to do a pro con list. And I did it and I immediately got a sense of freedom through like that exercise. So it was not so much about the pro con list, but the, the like answer that was the best fit at that moment felt so easy and free. Yeah, I think I understand that because I'm the type of person who's often resistant to structure, but I think an activity like that, writing it out, it can also be just the process itself of allowing your um, your body to kind of channel the answers like from mind to pen as you're writing things into either column. You might have just a moment of awareness where you realize like, oh, it's it's this one. Um, or maybe you've got 20 things in one column and one in the other, or maybe it's equally, you know, balanced and, and then you just throw the pen across the room and say, fuck, fuck this list. And then maybe that prompts you into a space where you just trust in your own, in your own intuition. Um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're valorizing or we're giving a lot of, um, credit to starting before we're ready And for me, that's been something that it's been really experiential and it's been like, I've had to do it a number of times in order to see the value in it and and in order for it to become a habit and for it to become something that I think is cool enough that we're talking about it on our first podcast. So I would love to know from you, like, what do you think is really cool about starting before you're ready? What, What do we learn or what happens that you feel like is, is worth doing it? Yeah, I think that 
because of the way most things work out where you may never be 100% ready to me, if you're always starting at 95% ready, then just start because will you ever be fully ready? And that mindset is like, from the moment you start to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, you're getting the feedback, the ebb flow, more information to make better decisions as you go along versus, you know, and I think perfection can be often a roadblock for people. If you're in that space of procrastinating, aiming for perfection, and you're missing out on the experience or that first step, you know, it could be quite the enemy of life, really. And then if you have that pertain to business, and uh, I remember a dear friend of mine saying to me years ago, she said, you know, it's always going to still feel like the new business, like whenever you start, like today, in three years, in five years. And she's like, and the benefit of it being today is that in three years when you would be starting, you'll now have been three years in and learned everything that you have learned. And uh, I, I saw her today and I, I was laughing. I said, you know, I, I didn't start when you said that to me. I'm starting now, which probably actually was exactly three years. And I said, but the blessing is I'm three years ahead of if I would have waited three more years. So Hell yeah, my, my point is you're not ever probably 100% ready because there's always something, the curveball something you didn't know, right? You don't know what you don't know. And that's why I love starting before you're ready because when you start, now you're like engaged, um, activated in, in the path and all the other pieces will start coming to you. I think it's so funny. You know, you said a lot of things that I just think are gold, but there are so many ways that we resist starting because we feel like we're not ready. So like case in point, I would like to have someone come and clean my house, but I feel like I need to clean it like (laughs) to a certain point. Like I feel like they can't come when there's like laundry and dishes and all of that stuff because it has to be kind of clean so they can start cleaning that. So I use that as a resistance to not have someone come and do that. Um, The gym, working out, how many people, myself included for many, many years and many different times have felt like, oh, I'll start going to the gym or I'll start going to yoga after I lose five pounds or after I feel confident in these pants or whatever. And it's like, no, just with any of it, if you just start now, then in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days or three years, hopefully it doesn't take three years, but you're going to feel this readiness or you're going to realize that that readiness was never going to, it was never going to be there. It was, it's, it's like a mirage, right? I almost right. think readiness is kind of like a mirage and like, I've, I've learned, the desert. I, I feel <laughs> like I have like a filter now too. When I hear people like commenting on like, why not? Or whether it's an excuse or a reality, which it could be both, um, start to understand like what's really going on for them behind the excuse or behind the why they're not ready. And that's really interesting because you can start to learn a lot about a person of like what's holding back what the blocks are. And uh, I'm laughing about the cleaning lady because I was speaking to a woman a few weeks ago who said, I feel like I have to have the house perfect and it's my responsibility. And I just hired a cleaning lady a year ago to come once a month. And it was like a very high, high, high level of wealth, but it was like all these reasons why she wasn't like good enough to have the cleaning woman because she needed to do it all herself. And I'm slowly seeing the story creep up and I thought, oh my gosh, like it could take any shape or form what our like underlying belief systems are. And it it was really interesting because when you said like the cleaning lady and not feeling ready to have her, it's like, whether this is for you or not, but there's almost like a worth, like, who am I to have this? Like, it's, I'm not all the way ready for that. And it's like, whoa, like you get the cleaning woman, it frees up three hours of time and like the environment and look at what else you can open up. And I think that's the same way I look at anything of being ready is when you take the first step, you have engaged in that trajectory that the other stuff sort of falls away and you're committed. So even at the most basic level, these decisions um, 
there, there tends to be a lot more going on underneath. Well, I like that you, you hit on resistance. When we examine our own patterns of resistance, that can illuminate our stories and our limiting beliefs and give us, um, give us the opportunity to kind of see it in a new light. Like now I'm re-examining my resistance to the cleaning lady. I'm going to go hire one as soon as we're done here. Good. Um, Action step. But but even that, like the, the question that I would have for you in this circumstance and, and for anybody that has their own roadblock for being ready and fully starting is like, if you were to paint that picture the way you'd like it to go, what would be the feeling? And could you tap into that now? And so, and then notice the things in your life that would start to shift even before you've even taken that step. Uh, but, and I do this with myself where I'm like, anything that I'm putting off like future-esque a little bit, I, I like to do some work around like, well, if I'm not doing that right now, if I did, what would that feel like if it went perfect? Mm-hmm. whatever perfect means, but to tap into the feelings because that cultivates like more momentum, I find than the procrastination and the, like the story around, I'm not ready. Oh, that's such like, that's such a powerful thing that you're saying. And just to make it actionable, like hypothetically, if it's me and the cleaning lady, which is like kind of a silly example, but the feeling that I would experience if I were to go down that road of, of bringing someone in is like spaciousness and relaxation. And you know that feeling when you come home and your house is really clean and there are clean sheets on your bed and like maybe your diffuser's going with some like citrus and peppermint and everything just feels like, it feels like taking a huge deep breath and a Mm -hmm. big exhale as you settle into your space, right? It's just just like spaciousness. So that's really cool to, to get into that. Um, present experience of a future feeling. And that's actually, that's like the whole magic of manifestation for, for anybody who's interested in that. Like that is the power of cultivate now what you want to be experiencing, what you desire and, and rest in the feeling of it. And that actually attracts it to you. It brings it to you. My cleaning lady is on the way. <laughs> And actually, there's several systems in place that if you wanted her on the way, she could be. That's so true. Um, yeah, so so we talked about some of the things that make us think we're not ready. And we talked about doubt and we talked about fear. Um, when it comes to like feeling unready for a job or for a business or for a task. I know that for me, some of the, there's like three main things that I've experienced. One is imposter syndrome, just that I'm, I'm not the person to do this as though there is a person to do it. Um, Two is fear of failure, which to be more accurate is not actually about me failing. It's about people seeing me fail. Mm -hmm. Um, And then three is, is just unreasonable expectations or expectations period um, that I have an expectation of something going a certain way or unfolding a certain way. And then um, I think I'm not ready because I think the circumstances aren't going to result somehow in that expectation, which um, so, so I wonder if, you know, you could share for you, um, how you would deal with those three things. How would you deal with imposter syndrome or how do you deal with imposter syndrome, especially, you know, launching, you know, leaving that position as a vice president, really high powered corporate position and diving into offering your gifts to the world. Was there any moment where you felt like I'm not ready because I'm not good enough or or are you just like, no, girl, I'm good? <laughs> no, I definitely can relate to that. And it's funny because my boyfriend sent me a podcast on imposter syndrome last week. And so maybe he, he sees it more than I feel it. Um, but there's definitely a question about being ready enough and 
I think I, this isn't necessarily like what I struggle with, but I balance like the thoughts on both sides where I want to be strategic right now. I feel like I have the gift of incubation and strategy to move forward as I'm creating my business and noticing the difference of being ready, like being ready, like just taking those first steps versus I got to get this right. Um, so that's, I don't right now feel like I'm questioning my ability to deliver my gifts to the world. Uh, but I do see how even that question of, am I ready? Am I ready versus being strategic and things making some sense? Like I look at this time for me as laying the foundation for the next 20 years of my life. So for that to take a little longer than a week to me makes perfect sense. This could be some some a little bit of time. And I, I believe that I deserve that. I will be making sure that there is momentum in action each day and each week also. And that's mm -hmm. where it feels like a, a fine line. Uh, mm -hmm. When it doesn't feel like strategy is just bullshit, like stalling, mm -hmm. but can I like have gut check with myself? And I think that I can. So yes, I do struggle with that to an extent. And, um, just, I don't know. It's like, to me, that rabbit hole can go really deep if you let yourself go there. And the biggest gift I've had over the past couple weeks and months since I've left my corporate job is to like notice the fear and the negative self-talk turn on. And I, I wasn't as good as, at it at first where I would go there really hard and deep and um, feels like shit about myself and what I'm able to do. And then I'm like, whoa, this isn't real. Like, you're ready. You can do this. You have gifts. You've learned a lot. You have experience. There's people that don't know that you can help. Um, so it's like affirming that I am ready. And that takes away any feeling of imposter syndrome. Yeah, I think you said so many nuggets of goodness that I want to reflect there. Like one, you just said that expertise is a spectrum. So basically like you're, you have so much expertise, you have so much knowledge to offer people and you're always going to have more than some people and you're always going to have less than others. And, right. and remembering that we're always in that process of being like the student and the teacher too is like the imposter syndrome is universal. Like that's something that I've realized recently more than ever um, my sister is a rocket scientist. She works for NASA. She's actually a senior level administrator now. And um, she shared with me just recently that she has imposter syndrome in her job. She feels like if people, people are going to figure out that she's not really supposed to be in that role. And it was like, this is my sister who I've always admired and looked up to and felt like she had it all figured out. And I was like the messed up artistic kind of wild one who's just like, and I'm like, wow, it's so universal. We're all, we're all experiencing imposter syndrome. So this is actually just part of being human. And that then inspires me because I'm like, cool. Well, what if I get to be the person who just experiences the imposter syndrome, but keeps showing up? I think that's key. Choosing consistency and and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like you do that and then you become the thing that you are desiring to represent. Um, and does it have to be like I, noticing even like attachment to imposter syndrome? Like I think my resistance to even like saying like I have imposter syndrome is because does that become its own resistance and story that isn't that helpful? Like, of course, oh, I, I feel like like a fake sometimes. And when he sent me that podcast, immediately I'm like reading some of the literature and I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is how I felt my whole swim career. And it's like, because I was an Olympian, because I was just like a team captain and on a D1 swim team for four years and, you know, not an NCAA finalist, like I wasn't a good swimmer. And it's like, well, compared to all the other people that, didn't X, Y, or Z, like you're an amazing swimmer. And yes, like maybe compared to the best Olympians, like you were an okay swimmer. But like choosing how I see myself, even in an example like that. And, you know, it's like in my career, like, well, I got to this point, but not this point. It's like, 
or you got to this point and that was awesome and which lens you choose to see yourself. Which lens do you choose to see yourself? I think that's so valuable. And you're right. Even the concept of imposter syndrome is setting up a binary opposition. It's setting up two different ideals or two different ideas saying that there is this state of being in which you are fake or false or forced. And then it's saying that there's an opposite to that, which would be a state of being where you're perfectly, fully genuine, authentic, embodied knowledge, ready. And that is not a state of being human. That doesn't exist. So you just blew my mind. <laughs> you just shattered him. <laughs> it's not real. It's, it's not, not real. real. And out of all the things that you'd like choose to have, like, why would it be that? And so can I be aware of myself getting in my own way with like not good enough stories? Certainly. But I, to like own imposter syndrome, like I don't have time for that. I don't see any imposters here. I can't Bye-bye. even say the word. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so what about, um, I want to ask you about the other one. What about the, what about the fear of your failure or perceived failure being seen? Because I think that's a thing that, that keeps a lot of us from starting. And it's not, it's not necessarily that we're afraid of things not working because I think most of us know that there will be trial and error. There will be, you know, what we call success and what we call failure. But there's, I think for a lot of people, or I can even just speak for myself, resistance around the idea that people are going to see me not succeed. And I know what I, what I think about that, but I'd love to hear what you think. I think so personally, like, you know, they often will say they, whoever they are, the experts say there's the fear of success and the fear of failure. And they often can look similar. Mm -hmm. And I used to think it was the fear of failure. And I've come to find that what I have is more the fear of success And what I mean by that is it's the changes that the success will bring. It's like, Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of my like greatest self upsetting the apple cart of what I know. Mm -hmm. And, and even that is a story. And so that like, I've become really like more in tune to that. I think you bring up an interesting point of the fear of failure around people seeing your failure which I can understand, I guess the difference for me, I don't feel like people are seeing, I don't know, I don't feel like super seen a lot. Um, So I'm being vulnerable. So there is, it's like it already, not that I feel like zero, but I do, I feel like there's nothing to lose. So I don't- Well, that's actually where I was gonna head with what I think is kind of the the falsehood in that, fear of failure or feel fear of failure being seen is that nobody's looking at us. Yeah. Nobody's looking at us. And even if some people are looking at us, they're not looking at you in, in expectation of being critical of you. And so this applies to all sorts of things. This applies to your outfit that you're wearing when you go out into the world and wondering if, you know, you look fat in it or your socks don't match or whatever. Like, guess what? No one cares. at all. They're literally so obsessed with themselves. I mean, we are creatures that by nature are um, empathetic, but really also narcissistic. Like everybody is, everybody is the center of their own universe. We are the center of our whole experience of reality. And so, you know, when we worry about um, our failure being seen like 99% of the time, like no one's going to see it. <laughs> so go and, like, ahead. I, failure, fail like forward, I feel up. <laughs> I feel excited by failure because any like great, any great through history, it's like they failed a thousand times and a thousand and one was the success. And so yeah. the idea of failure feels exciting to me. Like failure to me feels like information. It feels like knowledge. It feels like adjustment. It feels like a pivot. Um, so it's just their failure has become obsolete. Like the idea of failure Um, and people seeing me fail, like, "Eh, whatever, like they, like my, what I deem a failure, someone thought was a success. Like it's often perception. And, um, I, you, you brought up a good thought that I 
have escaped me, I'll bring it up when it comes back. Well, one of the things that I think is really cool that I heard recently um, is that the entirety of human evolution was a series of mistakes that then went right. You know what I mean? Or mistakes that proved to be adaptable, mistakes that proved to be valuable. Um, And I think yeah, reframing the word failure and just really, you know, this is kind of one of those things that becomes cliche and trite because we hear it a lot, but failure really is a, it's part of success. So we could just throw out failure altogether and just look at success and say that within success, there is a series of learning lessons and each learning lesson is an opportunity. It's a growth opportunity that usually comes through challenge and then overcoming challenge. And too often we're using the word failure to to describe that challenge and that period of overcoming it. But it's, it's necessary in order for us to, uh, to become one of those greats in history or even to become proficient. Like you, you know, the thing about like you watch a baby learning to walk and like the baby falls down all the time and you're not like, Oh, stupid baby. You're, you're a failure. You're never going to get it. You should just give up. Stop trying to walk. Yeah. It's like, that's just part of the process. And the, like the association with the word failure, like that's what I hear you saying is like, we don't, we can lose, lose the negative association and failure. Like one of the things I did recently was I reviewed my failures, like what I would have thought as failure or something that maybe didn't go away that I wanted it to go. And I realized, and I would recommend people try this exercise if they have anything they're stuck or caught up on. If there's something that's holding you back because you felt like you failed and you're afraid to try again because of that past experience, can you really do some work around what did you learn? And why I think failure can hold people back and down is because they haven't fully received the gift of the lesson. And when I put that together, I was like, oh shit, I have to really let go of this, but I'm not losing the lesson, like the essence of that experience. And so I I literally did that. I wrote down like anything in my life that I felt like sticky around or upset about, or just had trouble moving forward or through and asked myself, like, what would I do different next time? What's the lesson I could learn? Like, however that showed up on the other side and literally like tore the paper in half, burned the failures, like what I called a failure, like thank was like so thankful, like thank you, thank you, thank you for teaching me so much. Um, The limiting experience around these I release and now I'm taking with me all of these like gemstones of lesson and I feel lighter. I think that is so awesome. And what I downloaded as you were saying that, you know, you said if something is holding you back, reflect on that past quote unquote failure, examine what you've learned from it. This is something that I often say to people who are struggling in relationships, um, in their love life is, you know, every relationship that you have is teaching you what you need and what you don't need, what you're willing to tolerate and what you're not willing to tolerate. And the beauty of experiencing multiple relationships, even the toxic ones, the difficult ones, the ones with great heartache, is that you are being uh, sifted and refined and prepared for a great love that is in alignment with exactly what you need, exactly what you want to tolerate, not just want to tolerate, but want to experience and are calling in. And I think, you know, that process that you just described, it can be applied to so many things. And too often we feel like, oh, well, I've had three marriages or I've had three, you know, serious relationships and they didn't work out. So something's wrong with me. I'm just not, I'm not worthy of love or I'm not, I'm not able to do it or I'm bad at being in a relationship. And it's like, no, like you just had three powerful and potent opportunities to examine like what worked, what didn't work. What do you want and need next? Mm-hmm. Um, and whether we relationships, school, work, business, fitness, self-love, whatever. It's always that opportunity of continual unfolding and reviewing and then refining, um, you know, failure and turning it into, like you said, this nugget of gold um, that we get to, to then carry on to the next thing. The, 
there was something I wanted to ask you about in that, um, towards expectations. Cause that was the third thing we the said here. Third. Yeah. Let's redefine imposter syndrome. Let's redefine fear, fear of failure. Now, what about expectations? And you, you shared something with me the other day that I just like, I loved on this. So what do we do when we're not starting because we have some expectation of what it's supposed to look like. And there's, I guess that fear junk around like, well, if it, what if it doesn't look like that? What well, do we do? <laughs> I want to know what I shared with you. You, you shared with me, um, that, you know, we, we, we can start and release expectations. And it was definitely more eloquent than that, but it was really, it was about the, the magic and beauty of surrender and of being open to a flow state and of trust. And, um, for me, it's like that quote, you know, you, you um, about learning to fly where like, nobody knows how to fly. You jump and you find your wings on the way down. Not like not humans. Not physically. Don't <laughs> not advocating that you go and jump off the cliff. Uh, it's about birds. Yeah. I don't yeah. think <laughs> <laughs> this but idea ex- is that, there, yeah. you know, that we can release expectations of what something's going to look like. And then uh, there can be magic in it, even if it looks totally different than what we were expecting. Right. There is something I believe in our dreams, them as dream seeds, and literally like whatever you in your mind have come in to know or come in to dream about is like 120% capable of coming through you into the world. Um, so great news, right? You have dream seeds that can be manifest and the way to receive that or to come into that or to take action on that could look very differently. And so I have a lot of big goals for myself, which then I think goal and expectation are even different things, right? I have goals and what's the expectation around those goals? If I was attached to that, then that creates the expectation and then that can create almost like the sense, the ongoing sense of failure where it's trust. And I, I'll say something about the goals, as I mentioned earlier, like trust even in the feelings, like what is the feeling of goal A, B, C, and D? And can you hold into that daily? And then the action that you're taking is often aligned. Uh, expectation hangover has definitely been something that has caused me trouble in my life in various arenas and provided tremendous growth opportunity. And now, like you had said, like the surrender, like letting go of the attachment, like that's what works for me. And it's like uh, really holding the dream seed and the idea like so sacred and that almost like agreement of trust in that that or something better or in a way I don't know will come through me each day with the action and um, I'm becoming more friends with expectation of like not needing it. Mm -hmm. I saw something today, which is I think relevant to this. And it was um, a woman who's quite successful in her business as an entrepreneur or by all outward appearances seems to be, you know, she's stated publicly, she's making Uh, many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as an entrepreneur. She has a large digital community, et cetera, et cetera. And she said that she's shifting for 2019. She's shifting her priorities, her goals, or her, her focal areas within her business from success, achievement, and, and money to health and wellness, uh, love and connection and creative expression. And I thought that was such a powerful shift because mm-hmm. I also have, have been considering this lately as I dive more into entrepreneurship. Um, I've always been multi-passionate. I've always been an artist and a writer um, and a lover of movement, of yoga and surfing and paddling. And it's been my dream to create a cohesive brand or multiple offerings, even across different brands that allow me to do these things that I love and be supported and sustained by them. But as I dive into the entrepreneurship uh, industry or arena, I find myself falling into expectation of 
making X amount of money, of expectation of being fully booked with coaching calls, of expectation of putting together this massive leadership summit. And sometimes I've realized that my expectations are tending towards a life that is really full, too full busyness. Like I'm creating this expectation of success equals being really super busy and looking important to who? To the people who aren't watching. Right. right. And even right. You just like un- pulled the carpet out a little bit. And I think that a lot of people are drawn to entrepreneurship for the flexibility and like the ability to really create a life of your dreams. And then you find yourself because of the expectation, creating a life of your nightmares and, you know, holding yourself accountable to the ever evolving life of your dreams, right? As family grows, as business shifts, as family ages, like life changes. And so your idea of like your life of your dreams can easily become the life of your nightmares if you're not maintaining flexibility. And I would say like focus or the focal points on what really is important to you on a regular basis. So doing almost like a wheel of life activity, you know, rating yourself in different life areas as it pertains to you as an entrepreneur on some type of regular basis, quarterly, semi-annually is I think a really important exercise and um, something that really served you five years ago now might look a little bit different. And I think too, noticing just any lies that you may be telling yourself like lies or, or even like the attachment to like, there's nothing wrong with being really great at something. Like I found myself when you mentioned multi-passionate entrepreneur, like often wanting to like bring everything in. And the question is, does it need to be that, you know, can it, can you be really great at something and have there be offshoots from that? Like noticing, noticing, noticing the attachment. Yeah. And I think that when I, when I, do kind of start to slip slide down that slippery slope (laughs) to, um, to the expectation hangover, which is right. When we set these expectations for something and then it doesn't unfold the way we expect it to. And we experience disappointment or, um, or just self-criticism or criticism of other people because it just didn't go the way we wanted it to. When we do that, especially with like our business or our soul offering, our brand or, or a relationship or anything really, uh, you, you mentioned like go back to the feeling that you want to experience and, and go back to the dream seeds. And so with me, as I start to dive into this entrepreneur life and I, I look all around and I see other people doing big things and traveling and, and making a bunch of money and being very pre- visible online, it's like, wait a minute, what do I actually want to feel? and experience. And there's this very vivid image for me, which is, um, a beautiful home that's near the jungle and near the ocean, a space with a lot of books. It's very clean and open and expansive. And in that space, I am harnessing my creative potential through writing, um, and through making art and being in service to other people. So that I focus on the feeling, the feeling of expansiveness, the feeling of spaciousness, the feeling of um, being surrounded by natural beauty, the feeling of being creative and the feeling of being in service to other people. And then that allows me to drop back into like, okay, if those are really my core values and if those are my core desires, uh, let me focus on those and then let me stop looking around at what everybody else is doing, put my little blinders back on, let go of expectations of how I'm going to get to a place where I'm in those feelings and just focus on feeling them as I create from the heart and release things um, into the world. That's all. Yeah. I think it's amazing. And you know, the way things are going to unfold will like blow your wildest dreams out of the water. So that's where coming back to sort of the beginning is trust comes in. And it's like trust that this may not look like what you thought it would look like. And being able to have the presence to, and this is pretty damn amazing right now. And that's where, you know, this is like an ongoing art, I feel like, is to 
be able to look at your life in different areas and be like, oh, wow, like that's different and amazing versus like that's different and it's not what I wanted it to be. And oh my gosh, it's just like, wow, this is different and have the appreciation like flow in. And um, I think it can be easy to slip into like a victim mentality when you're in parts of your life that are different than you thought it would be. And like noticing suffering that could come up just because of that idea. So my question to you is, you're talking about the noticing and you're talking about um, perspective shift. For you, are there any rituals, affirmations, specific tangible practices that you do or that you would encourage other people to do to help them start? Yeah, the biggest thing I would encourage anyone to do is like start really tapping into the intuition and following charm. And what I mean by charm is like your curiosities, what, what you feel interested by or to, you know, it's the article that you find out the author was friends with your best friend and somehow you're having coffee with them and you've got a trip somewhere, like, you know, just something that could look so unexpected or different because you followed charm. Um, For myself personally, I am in a twice daily meditation practice that I find really grounding and amazing. I, um, from that, usually go into what I have right now is like a recording from one of the coaches that I work with. That's actually some of my dream seeds that I'll listen to daily in like a meditative state. And you could even do this recording for yourself. And that's what I've also done is made my own recordings of my own voice, like tapping me into relaxation. Maybe it's like cleansing, uh, letting go of any negative belief systems, allowing like great energy to come through. Um, And if I, I actually do this thing where if I'm feeling really overwhelmed and in an unresourceful state, I'll ask myself, what, what could I do right now that would bring me to a greater state? And if, if it's like, something as simple as breathing. It could be doing another meditation. It could be listening to one of those recordings. Um, But those are right now my most regular parts of my practice. Um, The other thing that I do is write. Yeah. Um, So the writing could look anything like a to-do list, to thoughts, to stories, to bad feelings. And um, the most interesting thing I've been doing lately is both feeling my bad feelings and then also feeling my good feelings. Mm -hmm. So I noticed for myself, like I had like been numb to feelings for a lot of years in my life. And some of my resistance and sticking points, I think are because I've avoided some of these feelings. Mm -hmm. And in the practice of literally like I'll pick like, what's the worst feeling I've had in the past few days that's like a sticking point, whatever comes up, like resentment, boredom, um, you know, whatever, jealousy, and feel that in my body and just feel the feeling and then let the feeling, whatever happened to the feeling. And on the other side, like asking myself, like, how would I want to feel right now? And in a resourceful state, like snapping into that feeling. It could sound a little bit weird if you're not into feeling work, but I find it to be really helpful and powerful. Yeah. And I think if people needed a more, um, maybe a little bit more specificity around that, if they are also struggling with feelings, it can be asking yourself the two questions of one, what is the worst that could happen? And then allow yourself to, as you envision that scenario, feel what that would feel like and then flip the script and say what's the best that could happen and spend more time there and allow those feelings that you would experience when the best is happening to really to expand and to marinate in those um so if you're struggling with just isolating just the feeling start with those questions what's the worst that could happen and then what's the best that could happen and allow those to be a springboard to feeling the feelings um With journaling, I love that you gave a couple little prompts there. One of the things that I find is really helpful in journaling is to, uh, if I'm feeling stuck, is to ask the question, 
that I'm seeking the answer to and, um, and then free write for like 10 to 15 minutes without any, you know, censoring, just let it pour out, even if it's total frustration and I don't understand what's happening and just kind of babbling. Um, but really asking the question of source, of presence, of God, of whatever word you want to use, but just, just or your, your, your highest self, your own knowledge, and then allowing that free right um, to express some of maybe the subconscious um, answers that you have in you. Um, so I love your list. We had, you know, tap into intuition and follow charm, meditation, creating your own dream seed recordings or um, affirmation or relaxation recordings of your own voice, which is incredibly potent and powerful. Uh, you mentioned your self-reflection of 10% improvement, which is one of my favorite life kind of practices and theories that you follow, which is just asking yourself, what can I do in this moment to feel 10% better, more confident, happier, more relaxed, um, and just it, it, not looking for a, a 200%, you know, turnaround or change, but just 10%, just an incremental, what could I do to feel slightly better here? And some, I, sorry to interrupt, but my, one of my like wins sometimes, it, like if I'm like, what was my win today? It was like, I didn't go down the rabbit hole to the negative 200%. Like I caught myself yeah. going there. It maybe was negative 10%. And I was like, what am I doing? And, and doing something to support myself to get out of that negative state. And I don't know, I think this might hail from the addiction communities, but uh, never get to lonely, angry, hungry, or tired, halt, mm -hmm. hungry, mm -hmm. angry, lonely, or tired. And uh, when in that question of like, how can I support myself right now? Uh, if you use that acronym, it's like, am I hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? And if I am yes to any of those, like, what can I do about it? And I just use that as a tool to help me like snap into a more resourceful state. So good. Yeah. And I think that ties right into with feeling your feelings, checking in with that HALT acronym, my hungry, angry, lonely, or tired can help you identify the feelings that you're currently experiencing that so that you can reframe them or change them. Um, and then self inquiry or inquiry of what's the best that could happen. What's the worst that could happen. I love that. Some simple affirmations. Um, one of the quotes that I love is, is, um, is start, now start before you're ready boldness has genius power and magic in it and that's a quote by Yadi that has always given me inspiration when i feel stuck um and and then another simple one is i am ready mm -hmm. i am ready um the knowledge oh, i yes. provided to me at the perfect time right any favorite affirmations that you have yeah i, I love yes like yes literally just screaming yes or saying yes um, and I believe that, like, I'm at the right place at the right time. I'm provided for. Um, I love reading. Like, sometimes I'll put my goals into I am statements and, and feel that, like, feel what the feeling is. One of the things that you brought up is, like, the worst case scenario. And this helped me so early on to be able to move through roadblocks. But it would just be, like, literally what's the worst like if i was down to my like last dollars like what's the worst case scenario and i'd always come up with like i moved to the bahamas and at first was like i'd be a bartender but then it became i'd be a chef um and i'd just be like island living like worst case scenario my last like enough money to buy a plane ticket and then i'd always be like oh that would be so fun and i'm like wow my worst case scenario is really fun and like, it took all the pressure off. And so I share that because it's something that I still will use. And it's like the, like the worst case scenario or the idea of failure, turning that into like almost a comical, like I got this. And I say that a lot, I got this. And um, it's not an affirmation, but I breathe. And uh, when I was younger, my dad taught me like squeeze your fist three times and inhale through your nose. Little did he know he was mastering pranayam. Uh, and I, I'll still do that. And it's just like a deep, big belly breath and noticing like, are my nerves flying away from me versus I got this. Mm -hmm. Well, we've shared so much goodness today. And, um, one of the things we'd like to offer to you each week is a reading opportunity, something that might support a deeper dive into the ideas or concepts that we're presenting. So 
today, without further ado, your Rise to Thrive book club selection is Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield. Um, and I'll share with you, this is a very short book. It's only 100 pages, and um, that's very purposeful and intentional on the author's part. He is encouraging creatives and artists and entrepreneurs uh, to get going doing the work um, and not to spend all your time reading books, reading blogs, watching YouTube videos, consuming other people's social media, <laughs> wandering around in online courses and webinars and <laughs> podcasts even. Um, <laughs> consume and as much as you need to, well, within reason, and then start. So I'll be reading a little excerpt today from page 18 that starts with, start before you're ready. Don't prepare. Begin. <laughs> Remember, our enemy is not lack of preparation. It's not the difficulty of the project or the state of the marketplace or the emptiness of our bank account. The enemy is resistance. The enemy is our chattering brain, which if we give it so much as a nanosecond, will start producing excuses, alibis, transparent self-justifications, and a million reasons why we can't, shouldn't, or won't do what we know we need to do. Start before you're ready. Do the work, ladies and gentlemen, by <laughs> Stephen Pressfield. You can pick it up uh, anywhere where fine books are sold. <laughs> the mic, mic drop of the day. Um, so that's, so that's it for today. What are we going to be sharing next week? So next week, we're going to have a compelling conversation that we're entitling Conscious Mummy. And this is how to uh, materialism, <laughs> materialism yeah. in, in a conscious experience. So mm -hmm. uh, navigating not only your bank account, your spending habits, um, ideas around wealth and abundance, negative associations to just to drop a few of the many tidbits to come. Yeah. And I think answering that burning question that so many people have of, of can I be financially abundant and free and still be a spiritual person, especially in kind of the wellness and yoga and um, self help and personal development landscape. There's always this idea that maybe it's noble to be poor. So we'll be inquiring whether that is true. Ooh, I already know our book club book for next week. Oh, so I can't dun, wait. Dun, to dun, dun. <laughs> oh, Linda, it's such a joy being with you in this space. Thank you so much for taking this time to dive into starting before you're ready. Um, the magic that happens when we choose to uh, welcome risk and just begin. Taking the step. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you to our listeners. Yes. Thank you guys so much for being here. If you enjoyed this, go ahead and subscribe. We would love to connect with you weekly as we share um, nuggets of goodness about mindset, money, spirituality, um, and the incredible power of the human mind. And remember, every morning when you wake up, you have the ability to rise to thrive. Yep. <laughs> oh, it's been fun, you guys. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye. 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 <laughs>